In today's video, I talk about hip imaging in athletes. This video is to celebrate my 100 subscribers, so thanks everybody, and it's basically a summary of an article that I wrote for Radiology a few years back. You can check the full article down with the link in the description. And now let's dive right into it. So this is the article that we are going to cover today, and you can see it has been written by me and by my colleagues Dr. Reto Sutter, Florian Buck and also Christian Furman. Hi guys! This is an interesting table where you can see the frequency of injuries within one class of sports that are affecting the hip or the groin. And as you can see it's very common among soccer players. Around 16% of all injuries soccer players have is affecting the hip and it's much less frequent in American football players. And the reason is that an American football player can have a lot of other injuries like finger injuries, fractures, tendon avulsion, stuff like that, because it's a full contact sport. Most hip injuries are actually muscle injuries. So most hip injuries are muscle injuries, that's true for soccer and also in American football. Although it's less frequent in American football, if an American football player has a hip injury, it's most commonly a muscle injury. And in both sports, intraarticular hip injuries are uncommon. So as you might know from your own practice, if you have a professional athlete and he has an injury, the first question they always ask is, when can I go back to training or when can I go back to play? And this is a nice table that shows you the mean days that these players lose due to an injury and it's very depending on the type of injury. And as you can see, contusions, you're out for about five days, whereas with adductor injuries, you lose about two weeks, labral tears because they eventually undergo surgery, you have a much longer period of time where you cannot go back to play. That's uh, also true for femoral acetabular impingement and obviously for fractures there is the longest delay. But the interesting thing about this table is the range. You can see the range here in the brackets and it's very very uh, large range so from one day to one month and that's true for basically all these different injury types except for fractures where you consistently have a very long period of time where you cannot participate in sports so keep that in mind because these studies that they reported these numbers it's always statistics you know it's a mean and you know what the mean says depending on how the distribution and stuff like that is um, there are minor contusions that don't need a lot of time off and then you can have major contusions and stuff like that now as you can see the hip joint is a ball in socket joint and has a very high congruency it allows for rotation in multiple planes and if you have any incongruency here either the femoral head or the head neck junction it might lead to an abnormal bony contact. And that's basically the concept of femoral acetabular hip impingement. As you can see here, the cartilage, it's thicker outside on the acetabular side, and then it's going to be thinner and thinner the more medially you go. And it's exactly the opposite on the femoral head. It's thicker inside the joint, and it's going to be thinner laterally. Another important thing is the labrum here. And as you can really depict here, we have the osseous joint would be over here and by having a labrum the joint surface is increased by about 22% over the whole acetabular fossa. It's also acting as a seal if you will and it's keeping the joint fluid inside the proper joint and not here outside the joint and by that it also enhances the lubrication of the joint and therefore you have less friction and stuff like that. That means also it adds a little bit to the joint stability and if you have labral tears you lose a little bit either being it coverage or also joint stability and that might lead to abnormally high forces and force transmissions through the cartilage and you are more susceptible to cartilage defects. So this is the first image from the article and the comments I would like to make here is if you do MR arthrography, make sure you know whether the patient had previous hip arthroscopy or not. Usually you point the needle in this direction straight down to the femoral neck and here at this location. So if there was no surgery before you'll find. If 
there was previous hip surgery, you might have something like here, um, broad adhesion of the capsule onto the site where the bone was removed and your needle tip might end up here within this scar tissue and adhesion and you have troubles injecting. So keep that in mind and accordingly adjust your approach and inject onto the supralateral quadrant. You can see that in the article as well. Now this patient here was before surgery on the left hand side and the image on the right hand side was a few years later and the patient had again symptoms and you can see that in the meantime, he developed some osteophytes here, and this is the osteochondroplasty that was performed, and you have here this adhesion, and they can actually be symptomatic, and what the surgeon can do, he can go in and release this adhesion, and the patient improves with better mobility and less pain. In addition, you can see also here there is a cartilage thinning already, so this is the beginning osteoarthritis already in a relatively young patient here. Now this is a very nice example of a hip contusion in an athlete and you can see that we have this bone marrow edema here in the femoral head and you can also nicely depict the cartilage here which is delaminated from the underlying bone and you have contrast here after orthography running between the bone and the cartilage so this is a cartilage delamination. And the reason why we can see this here in this case is because this patient had hip traction MR orthography. What that means is that you put a weight on the leg of the patient and you pull on the leg. There is a constant traction on the leg during the MR scan and you are widening the joint space a little bit. If you want to know more details about this technique, please check in the article. And if we wouldn't have done this in this case, we might have actually missed the delamination. We would have seen the bone marrow edema, but you can imagine if this femoral head is pressed inside the acetabulum here, eventually this fluid here would go away. So that's a very nice method to depict these femoral head cartilage defects and delaminations. Now stress fractures are always a very good differential diagnosis in athletes if they have some kind of bone changes. And here is a very nice example of a vertical stress fracture in the anterior column of the acetabulum. If the stress fractures occur in the acetabular roof, they are more horizontally aligned. You can also have stress fractures in the femoral bone here, not shown. And keep in mind that after arthroscopic osteochondroplasty for chem deformity, there are about 2% of patients that can get an insufficiency fracture of the femoral neck because the surgeon removed too much bone. This is a nice example of an avulsion injury and avulsion injuries are quite common especially in uh, adolescent uh, athletes and you can see here that would be the site where this big fragment of the anterior inferior iliac spine would belong to. It's a wolf and also you have this feathery edema in the proximal muscle of the rectus femoris muscle and this is the indirect head or indirect tendon of the rectus femoris muscle. This is the same patient and in addition to the volsion he also has this strain here of the indirect head also called pars reflexa of the rectus femoris muscle or tendon that the mu tendinous junction here in this case. And keep in mind that these avulsion injuries typically occur in sports like sprinting, kicking and gymnastics. And you can have other sites as well. And if you have an avulsion fracture of the lesser trochanter of a adult patient, have a metastasis in the differential diagnosis, although it's still pretty rare and not typically the case. That's it for part one. Make sure to come back next week when I upload episode two and you can also hit the bell button if you're subscribed and then you get automatically an email when the next episode is online.